at start at Old Trafford. Manchester United captain Bruno Fernandes given a straight red card for this challenge on James Madison in the first half. Dermot, what is your verdict on this? Right, a lot, lot of debate. Look, that's the referee's view. I don't think the referee can see it. That's the first point. I don't think the referee sees the challenge happen. And if you look at through the screen, you see the assistant flag it. The assistant has a, a different view, a different angle. I think if, if you run it on, you will see this is the assistant. Not, that's not his angle. That's the tackle. I think that's the referee's view if he sees it. But this is, the, this is the assistant's angle. Now, if you stop there, you can understand why the assistant would relay to the referee. He's high, he's off the ground. And he would have the impression that he's caught him knee high. But when you actually run it through, you see it's a glancing blow down the leg. He doesn't catch him like he thinks. There. I can understand the referee not seeing it. He has to go on the uh, assistant's view. The assistant's view on that, he thinks he's high. He's caught him like that. But he hasn't. I think he has an optical illusion. When you see it, a more palatable decision would be yellow card. OK. Which does beg the question... <laughs> I mean, some people are quick to say VAR gets involved too often. Mm. But when we see, as you wonderfully highlighted, Dermot, <laughs> the view of the referee was obscured and therefore he can't get a proper look at it, why isn't this the ideal time for VAR to step in and go, you might want to go on the screen, have another look at that. If you stick with it, that's fine. But if you don't, then at least we have done our work. Yeah, it's a good question, Rob. I, I can't answer it because they talk about the threshold. I'm not a coach and never want to be a referee's coach, but I just wonder with the headsets, um, the assistants pass that on, the, the referee hasn't seen it. With how it is, he's got time because he's blown his whistle. And at that point, the time is his only ally. And I wonder if different to what they do now, if he goes to the assistant and he stands and chats with him and they confer, they might still come to the same conclusion, but it would look better. As it is, I don't think many people really at the time thought that the assistant had any input. They think the referees made that decision. You hear people say the referee was very quick to get the red card out. I think the referee was led. And in my view, the referee was led incorrectly because of what we see at the end, because of that angle we saw. But if you pull all your resources together, I think you would come to a far, far different decision. OK, on reveal, 56% say it wasn't a red card. So the majority going not a sending off. That's, Dean? that's closer than I thought it would yes, be, same. though. Mm. And I think it is because he's high. And that's... Mm. I think you're right. The, the, the officials that were there on, on the pitch, it looked a red... You know, he slips, yeah, but he goes high. He goes at knee height, which ultimately is what they'll be, they'll be looking at. Obviously, the, the video assistant referees let him down badly because that's what it's for. When you're in the middle of the pitch, I wish everyone could try it, it's so difficult. The angles you've got to look at things, that is why VAR is there. That's why we're all accepting it and, and tolerating it because we want the referees to have that opportunity to go, well, I had a, didn't have a great angle. I, I understand you've given me some, some advice, but I want to see it myself. I want to see if it is a, a red card. It's a massive moment in a huge game when managers are under pressure, and I just think it was the per it was the perfect opportunity for for VAR to do the right thing. So, did you think it was a red? No, no, no. I, I thought he, I thought because he's gone high with the officials yeah. on the pitch. Absolutely, I can see why why it was given as a red card straight away. But on second viewing, he's he's not really <coughs> he's not really touched him other than with the the, the outside of his his boot. It's never a red card. I think he, he slips, he touches him with his heel, ankle. There's no force in it. It's not endangering an opponent. Definitely not a red card, but I go back to, to what you said there. The, if, if the assistant has waved his flag and he's give him what he thinks his view, he thinks it's a red card, that's fine. But VAR has got to say to him, go over and look at it again because you've not seen something. So it's like work as a team, help your mates out. Because if he goes over and looks at it again, I think he'll see that he slipped and I think he'll see that he doesn't connect with the studs, he connects with his ankle. And I think he overturns that. It's a yellow card at most. And, and, and also, we as players are doing everything we can to get him sent off. We are. <laughs> Madison's reaction, he doesn't take that big a blow. 
Yeah, he rolls around. The players come steaming over, of course, to the referee. So we're doing everything we can for it to be a red card, which is why VAR should be that tool that the referee's got mm. to be able to kind of take away that, the, the atmosphere, the players, and, and have a calculated look at the actual incident itself. I think, um, interesting, uh, I get everything you say, and I, I agree with everything you say. You made a very interesting point about the intensity, and I think that's the one thing... Where, where is it on that traffic light system? Does it, does it endanger a player, really? No, and I, I think, as Dean said, and I showed that angle, you see the angle from the assistant, and that will deceive him. He will be deceived by that angle, going, wow, look how high he is. But he can't see that point of contact. He can't see... The one thing he can't gauge is the intensity or the momentum he's gained in that. And I don't think he gains the momentum, as you say, because he comes for such a short distance. I think that's why it's not a red card. But I understand the referee not seeing it and the assistant seeing that view that he's got. I understand why he's conveyed that message. But then it's got lost, hasn't it? Yeah. Talk to uh, our two guests. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Let's uh, start with you, Sam Dean, because we're going to start with the Telegraph version of the Eric Ten Hag story, which dominates most of the back pages. Uh, Ten Hag, safe for now, is the line. Yeah, and I think for now is, is the key word. So the news we're reporting tonight, and, and James Ducker, my colleague, has been all over this all week and, and all day, is that Ten Hag is being backed for the next two games, at least against Porto and Aston Villa, which would take Man United into the international break, which, as we all know, can be a dangerous time for, for any manager. But as it stands, the support is still there for Ten Hag. And we know that Man United and Ineos, since they came in and took over, they've been standing by Ten Hag and backing him. And they certainly have done so in the transfer market and given him what he needs in terms of the players and indeed to, to a large extent, the structure behind him too. So certainly pressure mounting, but I think many people might have watched that defeat to Tottenham on Sunday and thought that could be the end. But we're reporting tonight, and I think across the papers, and as you say on Sky as well, it's not the end for Ten Hag. He still has time to turn this around. But it is very, very clear, and I think increasingly obvious, that the pressure on him really is starting to mount now. And the briefing, um, briefings that have been given from United have uh, led to headlines that can be written saying, they haven't been particularly, but they could be, two games to save his job. Uh, it's been made pretty clear that the focus is on the game's away at Porto and Aston Villa. Does that feel quite unusual for a, a club of United size and stature to allow that sort of conjecture? Well, I suppose it's a fair reflection of the situation. Just as Sam was talking there, I was thinking two games actually, it's a little bit like the old-fashioned uh, vote of confidence, words you don't really hear in football anymore. But that's sort of what this amounts about. OK, we believe in enough for these two games, but like, something big has to happen. And that's where, I suppose, the situation gets, I think, even more questionable. Because what do they expect to see in these two games that they haven't really seen over the start of the season, over the past few months, over last season? And it does feel as if it's almost one of these situations where United are banking on the positive momentum that comes from potentially good result or responsive performance. But we saw that in May with that crunch game that pretty much saved Ten Hag's job the last time, the FA Cup final. And it just led to this. And this now where injuries aren't really an excuse anymore. He's brought in signings. Other managers who have been in, actually in jobs less and have also had to adapt signings have had a bigger impact. So, I mean, what do United expect to see? I know it sounds a lot there like I'm basically, I think Ten Hag should go. But it does look, it, it, we're at a point now where it's essentially very hard to justify him staying in the job. And I think one actually the biggest issues is, is United's situation, or sorry, United's big decision in the summer, which is the first decision of this Ineos leadership, where, I mean, it's, I, I, can't, I can't really think of situations where a manager has essentially been interviewed for his own job, as they've spoken to other candidates, and they've, then they've just persisted with him. That immediately creates an issue. It creates a potential problem for his, for his authority, which we may have seen this season. And really, any manager in that situation has to have a really convincing run of wins to stave off talk about that. Otherwise, it becomes an issue. And again, here we are talking about it once more. Uh, we saw um, the Sun briefly, which does mention a line that some of the squad are questioning whether Ten Hag is the man. And if we look at the back of the mail, um, their back page splashed by Chris Wheeler and Sammy Mockbell going on that line. United stars expect Ten Hag to get sacked, Sam Dean. 
yeah, obviously it's quite an explosive line and it really does give an indication of, of the situation at Man United right now. And, and just on Miguel's point, I totally agree. And, and I'm sure the players feel this too, that when a manager does cling on to his job in the way that Ten Hag did in the summer and, and the fact that United quite openly were looking for other managers and looking at other candidates, when he, hangs, when he clings on to his job by such a fine margin, the only thing he can do to sort of solidify his position is to start the season really well. Anything but that, and the pressure is going to come back straight away. There's so little goodwill in the bank and there's so little credit there for Ten Hag to lean on that a couple of bad results and obviously a performance like Sunday, which was nothing short of disastrous. And suddenly all that pressure comes back and all the conversation, all the discourse that was happening in April and May around that Crystal Palace defeat and leading into the FA Cup final. It all comes back so quickly. It's, it's never gone deep below the surface. It's just there waiting to come out. And I'm sure in the dressing room too, they're aware of this and they're conscious of it and they're conscious of the fact that their manager was very nearly gone a few months ago. And you have to look at that through the context of their performances too. And you do have to wonder, and I'm sure, there, I mean, as, as we know, there were some pundits questioning this yesterday, but how, how much do the players really believe that Ten Hag is there for the long term? They know what the club were thinking in the summer. And yes, the club stayed with him, but it was hardly the greatest vote of confidence that they went around and spoke to numerous other candidates. So I'm not at all surprised by that report in, in the Daily Mail. And it, it certainly makes sense to me. Yeah, I'll say that the Sun do carry that line as well. I'm just going to show the, the back of the Times just for a, a little bit of, of balance. And they are going harder on the line that he is safe for now, as the Telegraph was also saying United in no hurry to part with Ten Hag. That is the Times headline. But if you look at the back page of the mirror, ends with a shout. Miguel Simone and Zaghi of Inter Milan. Yeah, who's obviously had a huge impact there, restoring the club to a Champions League final that they lost to Manchester City. Uh, something, given the economy of football these days, is actually a hugely impressive achievement, even if the run there was maybe a little bit forgiving. But he's, he's also made it into the, uh, the standout team yeah, sorry, the dominant team in Syria now with, with two titles. Um, but I think this also feeds into one of the issues around Ten Hag as well. I mean, that both Sam touched on there. That, I mean, really, the, the reason we're in the situation is because United couldn't find a suitable candidate that was readily available for the job on the terms at the time. Now, I do think actually one or two coaches in the summer they would have gone with had circumstances been slightly different and some more interesting. Tuchel is another and who, who may come into headlines over the next few days, depending how things go. Um, but that, that clearly hangs over all of this. Uh, but it does feel maybe the situation has shifted in the summer there where some names that would have been considered at that point aren't going to be considered now. And certainly, yeah, Simone Inzaghi, especially given his performance at Manchester City last week, claiming that draw in the Champions League, um, he's, he's someone obviously a lot of big clubs are going to be thinking about now because of the extent of his performance at Inter. Well, here's another name. Uh, who was with us, in fact, is still in the building, um, still talking on another Sky Channel right now, um, Graham Potter, who clearly is um, still available, uh, the male uh, online version, uh, mentioned his appearance. You could say that his interview here might have been an interview for uh, a United job interview. In theory, Sam, is, is, would he be a good fit? I think, I think you, you can see the arguments in favour of Graham Potter. And it was interesting to watch him on Monday Night Football. Obviously, he's been out of the game for about 18 months or so since leaving Chelsea. But uh, he's lost none of his uh, ability to delicately sidestep around a question, um, which was quite enjoyable to watch. As uh, <laughs> Nick Jones put him on the spot and on England and Man United. And uh, he, he certainly didn't confirm nor deny uh, any interest on his part in those jobs. And But we we know the relationship that Graham Potter's got with Dan Ashworth, and he spoke about that tonight. And that obviously makes him uh, a potential candidate for Man United. And it also seems increasingly clear that Potter's ready to come back. He, uh, the fact that he's on Monday Night Football tonight, for example, was an indication of that to some degree. And the other point I'd like to make on this just quickly is, I think from the moment the Euros ended, there's been a sort of, Gareth Southgate-shaped cloud over Manchester United, or certainly over Eric Ten Hag. And obviously, at the point of the FA Cup final and the point at which Man United were looking for potential candidates, Southgate was not an option. He was leading England into the Euros, and it wasn't clear at that point whether he'd be staying with England or not. Um, now, obviously, he increasingly does seem to be an option, and I do wonder how much that might loom in the way of Ten Hag in the coming days or, or indeed how much we might see of, of that from the Manchester-based reporters over the next few weeks because we know the relationship that Southgate has with Ineos and we know they like him. 
and he is around, he is available. So let's see if that one becomes a talking point or not in the next few days. I'm not sure what Gareth thinks about being associated with the cloud, Sam, but I, I know what you mean. Do you, <laughs> do you think that would work, Miguel? Would, would United fans fancy Southgate as their manager? Just from speaking to United fans, from spotting some of the stuff on social media, um, it does feel there's a touch of resistance over, well, maybe a touch is actually quite diplomatically put. I think it's much more than that. There are questions over how fully he fits the club, maybe questions over how tactically he did with England. I, I think the greatest argument for Southgate actually is, well, there's two really. One is he's been successful in cultural change with England. Uh, and secondly, um, I suppose there's, there's the connection as well, but also that it's, it's not just about the culture with England, it's also about the pressure with England. I mean, this is one of the things I increasingly think with the United job now. Being an excellent head coach is the most important requirement, but it's actually only half the requirement because a coach essentially has to have the per personality or charisma to kind of withstand the immense scrutiny that comes with being United manager. This is an issue that it's almost kind of gone on the radar again, given it used to be talked about so much, but it's there. And any coach is going to feel it, especially after a bad run. You have to be really strong to withstand it. Southgate has experience from that with England. I suppose, I mean, the questions maybe about him tactically uh, and the style of football, given he was sometimes criticised for conservatism and how much that fits with United, is obviously something that United fans would find resistance to. Maybe that comes down to how key your um, your assistant is or how advanced your assistant is. Um, but, yeah, it, it, as, as Sam said, it's one where I think you, you think momentum is going to grow. The, the only thing that I would say is that Southgate did maybe distance himself from jumping immediately back into football at a, at a charity uh, event recently and even spoke about how his next job might be outside football, which you can imagine the fitting as well. And perhaps maybe that, that may be why we're seeing more names come into contention for United. OK. When you observe Manchester United from afar, does it, does it look to you like the impossible job? Well, I think it's, uh, I don't think anything's impossible, but obviously jobs are difficult. That's that's just the reality of life in the Premier League. Is if you're not if you're a big club like Manchester United, and you're not in the top six, then um, there's always going to become scrutiny. I think you sometimes you have to look past the, the results and performances. And they've they've missed a lot of chances. They they haven't quite maybe got the points that they they think they could have got. Sometimes teams go through that. You know, you think you can perform your XG, but you don't. Um, and then you get a bad day like they did yesterday and all of a sudden the, the clouds can come over pretty quickly and that's what they have to face. Well, like you said, under siege and it feels like with every Manchester United defeat, the, the, the manager becomes under more pressure, Graham. Give, give us an idea of what that's like. You've been there in your last outing at Chelsea in charge of a big club where every defeat is a crisis. Sure, yeah. And, and I think the, the, the challenge is to try to have some perspective, to try to... Uh, rationalise what's actually happened, to speak logically. Uh, you know, after a game, everybody's emotional, of course, because football is about emotions, it's about feelings. Fans are hurting, they want to have answers, they want to blame somebody. And sometimes it is the manager and sometimes, of course, we make mistakes and we're not perfect. Um, but it's part of the job, it's part of what we sign up for. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Eric would say the same. It's, it's what he expects at Manchester United if you don't um, win or you don't play well or you lose then people are going to be critical. I think it was one of those games, whoever lost that game felt like they were going to be under pressure. It wasn't so long back that people were talking about Ange about no tactics or no plan B, and all of a sudden he's won four in the trot, and now all of a sudden everything's great for him, and it's flipped the other way. So you can't win unless you win. I think that's the thing. Uh, you need to try and get enough results to keep the you guys at bay. And in the meantime, <laughs> try to... <laughs> I'm saying you guys, but you know what I mean. Um, and then you've got to work with your players and stick to what you want to, you know, what you want to do and um, take the club forward as best you can. Another really tough week for them. They've got Porto, then they've got Aston Villa. Now, you've got uh, someone in the camp in Dan Ashworth that you've worked with before. You know a lot about his processes. Would you be confident that he has the, the skills, the ability to help steer Manchester United out of these difficult waters, back to their former glories? Yeah, absolutely. I think Dan's probably part of a team there as well. Um, I think he'll want to support, he'll want to, he'll want to help. That's my experience with Dan. I don't know anything about the context of Manchester United, but I think uh, my experience of Dan working with them in Brighton was he was very supportive. He would challenge at the right time, but uh, want to help and, and be there for you. So. I think football clubs you know, have to create conditions for coaches to be successful as well. Um, and that's what he'll try to do as best as he can. I hate to put you on the spot again, Graham, but it, it was 
much talked about this summer that Manchester United were having a lot of conversations with different coaches about replacing Eric Ten Hag. Were you among those that, that had a conversation with United? I, th I think uh, what I've read so far in the media, a lot of it's uh, untrue and false. Uh, uh, I think I'm the only coach in world football that's been linked with Stoke City and Napoli in the same week. <laughs> um, so I take what the media say is with a pinch of salt. And I think uh, I've had lots of conversations with lots of people. And I think for the, for the, for the respect of everybody, it's best that I keep those private. Kind of challenge you might welcome though or not? Um, I, no, I'm, I'm sitting here enjoying this challenge of answering your questions. That's where I'm at at the moment. <laughs> Good news is there's a commercial break on the way. Fantastic. <laughs> Jamie Carragher singles out Man United star for his role in Man United latest thrashing. Manchester United fell to a miserable defeat to Tottenham on Sunday, with Jamie Carragher now pinning the blame on one of Eric Ten Hag's star signings of the summer. Jamie Carragher blasted Matthijs de Ligt for his role in Manchester United's embarrassing thrashing at the hands of Tottenham. De Ligt was signed from Bayern Munich in the summer with high hopes he could help to firm up the Red Devils' backline. Those hopes have quickly suffered a knock though, with De Ligt part of a defence which has conceded six goals in their last two home games in the Premier League. Sunday's defeat to Spurs was particularly concerning, with Angie post men having also endured a mixed start to the campaign. But the visitors were ahead after just 155 seconds when Mickey van der Ven charged forward from his position in central defence and set Brennan Johnson up for a tap-in. While Gary Neville blasted Marcus Rashford for his role in that opening goal, Carragher instead took aim at De Ligt. He insisted the Dutch international was consistently out of position, which caused United numerous problems. I've noticed this with De Ligt and a lot of centre-backs, I don't understand why they don't fill the space and come over. The striker just behind him has got nothing to do with him, that is Martinez's job, Carragher told Sky Sports. If De Ligt goes over, Martinez comes across. He looks over his shoulder here, forget that. Forget it. Get here the space Van der Ven runs into. This is a brilliant run, amazing. But Van der Ven runs because he sees the space. Listen, the fullback gets caught out at the back post, we see him with his hand up. Again, I want to go to De Ligt. This sums Manchester United up over the last two or three years. Pressing and always being late. They're locked in here, you've got the front three of Tottenham locking in the back four, and you have him here free. There's two men on one player. De Ligt should already be over. We run it on and just look at De Ligt flying across, flying into the challenge. It comes from his starting position. I can talk about United's midfield, running at the back four. But where's De Ligt? The right backs come up and look where De Ligt is. You've got to get over. So in every situation in the first half, De Ligt, a player they brought in for huge money, is completely out of position. Carragher was not the only one who pinned the blame on De Ligt for United's awful defeat. Legendary Red Devils midfielder Paul Scholes also questioned the centre-back over his difficult start to life at Old Trafford. When you bring players in, you expect them to be a lot better than who you've already got. I don't see players coming in who are a big difference. De Ligt has come in for Maguire, let's say, but there's no big difference there, Scholes told Premier League Productions. These are experienced players who United have paid a lot of money for. We need to stop hearing excuses and get on that training pitch and find a way of playing. Find something, give us something. Manchester United legend Patrice Evra has claimed Sir Alex Ferguson had moves for Cristiano Ronaldo and Gareth Bale blocked by the club in his final season in charge. Sir Alex Ferguson had lined up moves for Cristiano Ronaldo and Gareth Bale in the same transfer window, but retired after Manchester United refused to sanction the deals. United legend Patrice Evra has claimed Ferguson told him that Ronaldo and Bale had agreed to join the club in 2013 for a combined 200 million, with the Red Devils boss stating that he did not plan to retire for another decade as he wanted to win more Champions Leagues. However, Evra says United refused to give him those 200 million and Ferguson ultimately retired at the end of the season. Evra made the bombshell claims in an appearance on the Obi-1 podcast, which is hosted by former Chelsea star John Obi Mikel. When asked about Ferguson's decision to retire, he said one of the most saddest days, I didn't cry, I was in shock. 
the reason why is because two weeks before, he brought me into his office and said, Patrice look at those people, they think I'm going to retire, I'm going to be here for another 10 years, but we need to win more Champions Leagues. He said, Patrice, Cristiano Ronaldo agreed 99% to come back and Gareth Bale too. He needed 200 million and the club refused to give him those 200 million and now, they spent a billion on whatever. It was 2013, just before he retired, so that's why I remember when I got out of his office, I was like, Cristiano is back, Gareth Bale, were back in business after winning the title and everything. That's what he said, I need to win more Champions Leagues. Ultimately, Ronaldo remained at Real Madrid until 2018 when he left to join Juventus and he did eventually return to Old Trafford in 2021. However, his second stint ended acrimoniously when his contract was terminated after an interview with Piers Morgan where he criticised the club and he is now playing for Al Nasser in the Saudi Pro League. Bale, meanwhile, did leave Spurs in 2013 but made a big money move to Real Madrid instead of United. He spent eight years in Madrid, winning five Champions Leagues and three La Liga titles, before retiring in 2023 after a brief stint at Los Angeles FC.